501c3 Research Institute. So, I'm, I'm the key word is human ecology. Uh, what is human ecology? It's a, it's a field of science which is coming along very fast, uh, which, which is not integrated medicine per se, it's not natural healing per se, it's not allopathic per se, it deals with a human being as an ecology. An ecology being everything which affects you, everything you do, everything you feel, everything you say, everything you need, they all affect who you are. And that's just not a cliche, uh, it's based on actually scientific literature and where 21st century medicine is going towards. That's my bias. Uh, and that includes our religious thinking, our non-religious thinking, doesn't matter. Whatever you think, whatever you do, whatever you feel, and how you feel about others, how other people feel about you, all of them interact. A simple example to get into this from a uh, side way is we all have a heart, obviously, and it's pumping. And when the heart is pumping, like any pump, it generates an electrical field or a magnetic field. And each one of the heart's magnetic field is five feet around us. And it's been well studied by the Japanese. So if you hug somebody, what happens? Your field interacts with their field. What happens to that? Uh, that I will leave. My other two colleagues are much more in that than I do. My <coughs> mind is more scientific paradigm coming in than ecological paradigm. But what I'm trying to make a point is everything interacts. Everything we do changes who we are and affects other people. Now, that's one way. Now we are, what I would like to look at is microbiome and what microbiome is. Because we are talking about gut, gut health, uh, probiotics, prebiotics, a whole slew of other things, how to heal the body with the gut. What does that all actually mean? And what is the status of that from the point of science, not just science and <coughs> MD science or AMA science, but cutting edge 21st century science. And I'm hoping to give, impart that to you so you have a framework to work with. That's us. Basically what it is, human beings live in an ocean of bugs. Uh, we have bugs all around us. The bugs are on here, on our hands, on our food, on our toilets, on our toothbrush, on our glasses, everywhere. They literally swim uh, in a soup of microorganisms. Bacteria, viruses, parasites, yeast, all of that. They live in it. Just like uh, fishes live in an ocean, we live in an ocean of bugs. Okay. Now, this, this concept has been known for a long time, but most of you may not realize that human beings have been on many adventures, that is going to the moon, or is it breaking the human genome, our genetic code, which we did. And originally it was thought, if we can break the human genetic code, that means we will solve all our problems. We'll be growing back limbs, we'll solve cancer, all of that. End result was, yes, we broke the human genome, but nothing really changed. The world still goes on the same way, messed up as ever. Why? The idea of ecology is not, you just, a plan doesn't help you. If I took a, a plan for an atomic reactor, gave it to the primitives in New Guinea, so they have a plan, what does it mean? Having a plan and building a functional reactor is something else. We all went to the moon in the 1970s. But right now, in the United States, somebody said, let's go to the moon, we couldn't do it. We literally cannot do it. Why? The infrastructure is gone. So that's got a lot of, when we talk about root cause analysis and root cause, we are talking about infrastructure. What is the infrastructure? If you understand the infrastructure, then you understand what is needed, and then you can look at the process. Uh, oh, sorry. So what happened is NIH actually put together a project which has been, which didn't get as much publicity in the lay public or in Hollywood, but for me, in my point of view, is it is probably the greatest adventure human beings have ever undertaken. That is the NIH Human Microbiome Project. It was a $17 million project, which is pretty inexpensive overall, $17 million, 20 nations. They all got together and said, we're going to study this thing with bugs. If you're really living in an ocean of bugs, we should know what the bugs are all about. Yeah? So they started doing the study, and that was to quantify, to break down artificial barriers between medical microbiology and environmental microbiology. In other words, look at another way with the barrier between medicine, which is in the lab looking at the microscope and treating the antibiotics, versus the natural science the environment. Uh, what do we eat? Raw food? What does it really mean? 
we need to have it. We all believe raw food is good for us. We all believe organic food is good for us. Is it really so? Uh, let's study that. And that's what they did. And ultimately associate difference in communities with difference in metabolic function and disease. Again, this root cause. And this was the biggest study, in, in my opinion, in medical science and human history. We were studying life forms. Uh, what lives within us, what lives outside us, and how does it affect us. This is just information on data, 2000. Just think of this line here, as that's the amount of data we had. In the year 2000, you went to your doctor, you got your cholesterol checked. You got your kidney function checked. They listened to your lungs, heart, all those things. That was a set of data sets. Since then, look at the increase in data. So not only are we getting more information on improving our body, and discovering diseases, but the biggest improvement is microbiome. Information on bugs within us. That's huge, the amount of data we have. Okay, so a lot of these things when we talk about, and this may be a little, a little bit of heresy, but I like to throw a point in. The concept of natural medicine, or allopathic medicine, all those things, they're all obsolete terminology. Because we have data. It's not like it's my opinion or it's your opinion. We have data, we have information, we have factual things, by which we can take that and then create a new form of medicine, the medicine for the 21st century. Whether you call it medicine, whether you call it healing, or whether you call it ecological medicine, it doesn't matter. But everything we know in the 21st century, uh, so far, in a sense, I propose to you, is obsolete. Okay? We are at the new age of real medicine. Human genome. Human genome is the gen genes in our body. How many genes do we have? Before the Human Genomic Project, we thought human beings, we are the masters of the planet. We probably have 200,000 genes. Then we said probably 100,000 genes. And we felt pretty good about it because we are humble now. When the Genome Project went in, all of a sudden said maybe it's only 30,000 genes and people didn't believe it. How can that be? You know, we are human beings. We are the apex of evolution. Then it came to 23,000 genes. This slide is a couple of years old. Then it came to 19 to 20,000. Now it's closer to 19,000. The reason that's important is uh, a yeast, a simple yeast which you used to cook, a uh, baked cake, that's got 6,000 genes. An earthworm has pretty much the same amount of genes as we do. Rice has more genes than we have. So see how it shifts our paradigm of thinking of medicine. So when we think about a lot of the time mainstream medicine and doctors and white coats and stethoscopes, they're an obsolete image. Science today is getting close to a point where all that is gone. That's just like the most of the medical system we have is like the living dead walking around, zombies, with no real life in them. Because this is what science is showing us. Now, come for a human microbiome. <coughs> microbiome is just DNA, RNA, what it's made of. Because most of the bugs that are on us, we don't even know what they are. So when you tell people, you know, take this probiotic pill, one really has to wonder what's in them. Because if majority, 99% of the bugs, we can't even grow them. So if you can't grow them, you can't package it. So what we have in the packages is things we can grow, we can package, and sell it at a certain price. Most of those things are invisible to us. And the microbiome, human microbiome, we thought, would be about a million, a million genes, compared to our 19,000 genes. A million genes. Now it's gone up to almost to 3 million genes. So it's 1 million to 3 million, depending on which laboratory publishes it, and was published three months ago or published yesterday. That's, the, that's what we're talking about, the huge number uh, of genetic material. And what does that? Your body has 10 times as many microbial cells as human cells. In other words, if an alien came in, on, in here, saw me, picked me up, and said, I want to study what this, what this creature is, <coughs> takes me apart cell by cell. Only 10% of who I am is human cells. 90% of the cells on me, in me, is all bacterial cells. 90%. So the human being is really, uh, is 10% of cells are a structure which carries bacteria. So you can make a very good case, we are actually uh, a carrying unit for bacteria. Okay, now, after that said, when you look at the myogenes, genes are what translates to information. 
which makes us all function. And you are we are saying the bacteria is abundant. That means you can almost say human beings are really bacteria. And what we think, what we feel, everything is going to be affected by that. And that's something which I hope to put some information in. Here's something else. I'm going to step forward a little bit so you can see this one. Well. Uh, and if you look at it, each part of the body has a different colony. It's almost like in, uh, if you take the United States, the population in New York is different than Virginia. Actually, even in Virginia, Norfolk is different than uh, uh, Virginia Beach. Uh, Hamptons is different. Same thing in the human body. Every part of the body is a different colony. Everything. So it's not one thing. So what I take in the nose, edge of the nose here, and up here, there are different colonies, different bacteria, different species. That's what we're finding out. Okay. Kind of gives you this look back. The bacteria. These numbers are all gone. It's 500 to 1,000. Now we know it's more than 1,000. So every part of the body, and this is what the human genome, uh, I'm sorry, uh, microbial genome project is finding out. <clears throat> the amazing diversity of bacteria in us. What's on our skin is different than what's in our gut, what's in our mouth, what's in our hands. They're all different. Okay. Now, these are some of the things to give you an idea. Some people, nature called it fellow travelers. Basically saying that, you know, actually, when you say I'm lonely, you can never be truly lonely because we always have travelers with us. <laughs> right? <laughs> and that's a fellow travelers. Uh, Michael Baker man. That's another one, economics, and that's an economic journal. And why is the economics speaking about microbiome? Because microbiome literally changes how you think, you feel, and everything else you do. Okay. And you're in the ecology system of scientific America. We're going to move past a little bit right now. Again, microbiota, which is like the microbiome, microbiota is mostly what's in the gut, affects everything. It affects the gut, it affects the heart, circulation. It affects the immune system. In fact, uh, we'll come back to this slide. Most of the immune system is in the gut, not anywhere else in the body. So how you treat your gut reflects on what kind of immune system you have. Affects the bone, the kidneys, and affects the brain, and affects behavior. And this we know very well. A lot of studies are being done. And how do we know? Most of the studies are on mice. The thing about mice is you can genetically grow mice which has no, which is sterile, which has nothing in the colon. And then we can introduce whatever we want. So each one of you want to take your take your poop literally, put it in the in the rat and see what the rat the mouse does. <laughs> and really, you take a fat person's uh, uh, poop, put it in the in the mouse, the mouse will become fat just like that. Okay. Uh, you get somebody who's really depressed, take the microbiota, put it in the rat, you'll have a depressed rat. So we know indirectly that microbiome affects everything. Here's something just with the gut. It's gut about 10, actually 10 trillion bacteria in the gut, 100 million neurons. Next to the brain, the gut is the second brain. 60 to 70 percent of all the immune system is in the gut. The surface area is 300 meters. That's huge. That's where all the system, most of the things work. And that's why Ayurvedic medicine, a lot of very, very medicine, the ancient medicine, they all focused on this. But I would caution you, when you have a hammer, everything looks like a nail. Uh, and that goes, you go to an orthopedist, everything is orthopedic. You go to ER physician, it's ER physician. But same thing happens. You go to integrated medicine, everything is integrated. So one has to be careful. Uh, yes, the gut is a big, big issue, but it's not the only issue. Okay? So when we talk about natural medicine, you have to think beyond everything. Gut is a huge player. Okay? And here again, each part of the gut has different, bacteria, different type of bacteria. And how to colonize that, we really don't know much about. There's no such thing as good or bad uh, bacteria. There's potential harmful bacteria, potential beneficial. Candida. We all have age war on candida. But candida, the yeast, is normal. Everybody, every human being has it. When it becomes predominant, when the biodiversity of the gut becomes slow, then candida and other things become deadly. On the other hand, if you have a high biodiversity, they will keep it all in check. You actually need the bad, bad bacteria. Because the bad bacteria <coughs> keeps and trains the immune system. Going back. Okay, so. Breastfed infant, formula fed infant, we all heard about that. If you're a breastfed infant, 
and vaginally birthed infant, they have a different bacteria than a C-section that person. Because when you have C-section, they're coming up to the abdomen, so they have all the bacteria of the skin. A vaginal birth has all the bacteria in the vagina. So what happens to a lot of midwives, uh, if, they, if they're going to do a C-section, they take some uh, uh, cloth, a wet cloth, wipe it, put it in the woman's vagina. When the baby is born, they take it out and put it on the face and the body so you can recolonize it. Okay, uh, just a simple stuff. This is, a, this is how a map would look like in the microbiome project. They look at it and look at, look at each one of these things and covers, you can say, they're mapping the body. And it's amazing how they are similar. Okay. Now, simple thing, microbiota is microbiome, bi microorganisms that live inside the human being. Microbiome is the genetics of that. And biofilm is a community of microbes that live together on the surface. Now, biofilm is a big issue. I'm just going to put a fast line. Biofilm is not bad. You know, biofilm, biofilm is what your body has. Uh, it's on the intestine. It's the slime that's on the intestine. Your muscles move against each other because it has a biofilm. Biofilm is the slick oil which keeps the body working. When the biofilm gets invaded by bad bacteria, then the biofilm is bad for you. Otherwise, biofilm is how the planet and life exist. Okay, let's keep going. This is again what we just said. I'm going to go faster because I'm running out of time. A gut microbiota. And you can see these are the bacteria, but when you look at the bacteria, they affect actually the T rex cells, one of the big um, immune cells, which affects your immune system. Down regulated, up regulated. It's just how, what kind of bacteria you have. Okay. So you've got 100 trillion microorganisms, 10 times more than the human body. It's got 2 kilos of mass. When you think of the brain, the brain is less than 2 kilos. There is more bacteria in your body than the brain. So a lot of the time when you think about brain, you think about, oh, everything is the brain. But really, what does the brain do? Functionally, the brain responds <coughs> reflexively to what signals come from the body. And the majority of the signals which comes from the body is the microbiome. See the difference? So it responds to that. That's why depression, for example, the easiest thing for me to tell is a five-year-old kid who has got to go to, after all, five, say three-year-old kid has to go to a preschool. And uh, what does he or she do? They get stomach pain. Mm -hmm. It's not a learned behavior. Uh, it's a brain and the gut connected. And the brain is nervous, the stomach is nervous. When you are in love, what happens? Butterflies in the stomach. Mm -hmm. uh, that's what it is. In the old days, the movies, the 19, 13, 14 movies, what happens in a battle, in a, in a fight? You hit, hit them in the bread basket and the person passes out. Because most of the nerves are right there. You hit them in the right place, you short circuit your body and you pass out. Okay? So I'm trying to bring all these things together. Now we're going to go very fast uh, here. For example, what does the, what does the bacteria in the gut do? It actually synthesizes vitamins like B, B1, B2, B3, B5, B6, B12. A lot of us take a lot of vitamin pills. We check the body's level, we have low vitamins. If you have the right bacteria, you won't need that because your bacteria will make those vitamins. Okay. Now, here's one line I would like to stress. Training the immune system. Bacteria in our body train our immune system. If you don't have the right kind of bad bacteria, if you will, and the right good bacteria, <coughs> your body can never be trained. Having bad bacteria in your body force your body to recognize it and keep it under control. So you need that. Okay. I'm going to stop right here. My time is out. Um, so hopefully, I set a structure for you.